Right, hello, everybody. This is back-to-back -back presentations, maybe the only time during the conference. So I have a half hour, so this will be a bit of a lightning talk. Um, but I'm going to keep it high level for that reason. Hopefully, we'll have time for questions as we go or at the end. But if not, um, you can meet me pretty much the rest of the conference anytime. So I'm Steve Wolf. I'm with Rally Software. And I'm also channeling a partner of mine, a colleague of mine at Rally named Larry Macaroni. Is anybody here familiar with Larry and Larry's research work on Agile metrics, Agile analytics? Well, I will give you a little bit of an insight into what he's working on um, as part of our research efforts and how we're looking at helping teams improve with, with Agile. Now, one thing I, I do want to say is uh, we are working at Rally on what we call a performance index framework. And this is what Larry's work is largely based on. And the, and the basic idea is to, we could talk all we want about how to measure team performance. But we're, what we're trying to do is do research with um, our large number of customers around how they're performing, looking at their data, and coming up with you know, key outcomes and key metrics that we can use to help you know, all teams using Agile improve. So the question is why? Why do we want to measure? Why do we want to see how we're doing at an Agile level? How many of you uh, are familiar with uh, the saying, culture eats strategy? Has anybody ever heard that one? The Basic premise, no one's heard that one. The basic premise of that is that no matter what kind of plans you lay out, no matter what your strategies are, the cultures of the people doing the work are the, is going to really dictate how well that ultimately goes. If the teams aren't motivated, if they're not engaged in the work, I wouldn't say they're going to purposely sabotage it, but the effect will be that you're not going to have the outcomes that you're ultimately shooting for. So it's important that when you look at measuring Agile, because it's such a team-oriented approach um, to getting software developed and done, that you build these measurements with them in mind. In fact, the whole idea here is that give them measurements to help them comp to, to complement what they already know put into terms that they can now see and visualize, how am I really doing these insights that I have? Are they working? Ultimately, let them make the decisions on the ground. Uh, we empower Agile teams. We give them business ownership. We give them responsibility for solving customer problems directly. We need to give them the measures now to see how they're doing with that. So that said, there are some ways that you can misapply Agile metrics, we call them the seven deadly sins. Some of this is the outcome of uh, Larry's work that I mentioned earlier, as he starts to look at some of the bad practices as well. We've all heard about the dark side of metrics. What we're trying to do is avoid that and give you some real practical input on, on how to, uh, to effectively measure. So why do we want to measure? It's back to this, sin number one. Sin number one is don't use measure, uh, metrics as levers. Don't use these to be at a team over the head and say, you need to do more, go faster, et cetera. Um, also, don't use them as absolutes. You know, they're just feedback. It's a feedback loop, which we build into Agile from the beginning. Use it to help a team or an individual understand how are they getting better, um, their own performance or their team performance. Is this insight that I have really paying off? Is this training that I took really making a difference? Give people some insights into that. Don't use levers again, though, as they can be a hammer, and that's where people start to fear them, and that's where you start to see teams not even really want to deal with them. Sin number two. Okay, I don't know that, I'm from America. You've probably figured that out already. I'm from Colorado, and we love basketball there. I think cricket's the national sport here, maybe soccer. Does anybody here watch NBA basketball? A few people? Good, good. Well, here's a player who's I guess used to be near and dear to my heart until I figured him out. He played for Denver, which is where I live. And basically the, the sin here is you know, don't look at a metric and, and then guide everything around it. You need to look at the outcome or what you're really trying to achieve. Here's a player, Carmelo Anthony, and there's another example up here. Scores a lot of points. People used to love him for that. I think probably a lot of people still do love him. But when you really evaluate the team performance, which is the outcome we're really shooting for, how's that team performing? He's had mixed success. He takes a lot of shots. Some people would argue he steals shots from the rest of the team. He's so focused on you know, being the star and, and, and getting his, his due and, and taking his shots. But that's not really leading to the best outcome for the team. And this is backed up through some analysis. There have been periods of time where he's been out of action due to an injury or what have you. 
And the numbers would show that the teams actually performed better most of the time when he was out. Because he wasn't, you know, we were looking at a metric and glorifying him around that metric that didn't really lead to the right outcome that the team had. And that basically is to win. And so that's now how we uh, want to present and look at, at metrics. And this is a term Larry's come up with. It's, um, it's called the Odom Framework. You don't want to start with the metric. You don't want to look at a, a scoring average in basketball and think somebody's getting the job done. You want to look at your outcome. Start with your outcome, work your way back. And the way this fundamentally works is metrics just help you gain insight into a problem that, at hand. From those insights, you can make better decisions. And those decisions will be in place really to drive the outcomes that you're, you're going for. An outcome in this case, in this example being um, better basketball team performance, but in, your, in an Agile software team's case, it would also be team performance as opposed to uh, you know, something very specific. Okay, bad analysis. This chart here is a fairly typical statistical standard deviation chart. And a lot of organizations will look at this and look where you sit within this to, to measure and, and determine how you are performing as a team. And, and, and this, you know, this has application. It works well. We see it work well in manufacturing. Let's say you have um, uh, you're an axle manufacturer and you want to measure how many of your axles are going to come in with a certain diameter and what the outliers are going to be so that you can then start to set expectations for the people you're selling to, even a service level agreement. This works great for that type of application. Works great in business, you know, where you start to see kind of normal curves emerge, looking at the mean and looking at the dis, uh, standard deviation. Um, but in software, it's a little bit different. This is actually a chart. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it later. But it's a chart from uh, real data from one of Rally's teams. And essentially what it is sh showing us is that we're not normal. If you look at the curve and the histogram on the right, uh, you can see that it's not flattening out. The tail, in fact, is, is starting to get a little thick at the end. Fat tail, we call it. Uh, and this is because of the nature of software. Software is a very inherently complex problem. Uh, you may also have other reasons for some of these uh, stories that you're working on that allow them or force them to, to get larger over time. And so your standard deviation might say that in a normal world, we would be at this 98% point, which is something that we would then use to predict how we're going to finish off in a normal amount of time, let's say two weeks. Because of the fat tail phenomenon we see in software, that can actually lengthen out quite considerably because you do have these outliers, these, these cases, these features, or these stories at the end of the tail that are taking a lot longer than you expected. And really, again, just to amp amplify that point, it's because of the nature of software. And sometimes these, these tails, these uh, outliers, are, are great. Sometimes you want them. Let's say it's a black swan situation where you're, someone's just exploring and learning and coming up with an entirely better way of doing things. It's worth investing that time. Maybe, again, it's, it's a simple research element. Um, or, you know, maybe it's something you need to go investigate. Why are these stories blocked? What, what cross-dependency do we have, for example? Uh, let's go ahead and evaluate and look at those more closely. That, in turn, help the, the insert, um, insights we gain from that, in turn, help us make better decisions down the road. So cycle time is really a pretty significant measure in software. Uh, delivery. We want to know how quickly we're able to get a, um, a feature or a work item through a given set of states. Again, to help us with predictability. And this is a chart I think taken from the Kanban world where you, you try to apply like a manufacturing approach to process control to software and it, it just doesn't work. There are reasons for these outliers and what tends to happen then when you start to use charts like this these red dots become things you want to avoid. The people working on the teams start to fear those because they start to get beat up for them, even though there's really practically good reasons or good insights to be gained from understanding why you're having those, those outliers. So it's really not a good approach to use process type control charts when you're managing a software project or looking at a software project. And again, this is back to the chart I showed you earlier. Uh, it's, it's got some similar elements. This is a chart Rally has come up with. It's called a, we call it a time and process or time and state chart. And you can basically define it at any work item, set of work items you want, let's say from a portfolio level, 
down to a, a team level around tasks and defects, whatever you want to look at. And then you start to look at it in the context of cycle time. And again, that could be however you define it. It can be from uh, development time through acceptance by a product owner. It could be through uh, upfront story creation all the way through release into, uh, into product. So you can define both sides of that. And then you can start to really evaluate how's this team doing and how, where are they at. So you have the scatter plot that I showed you in the previous slide on the left. You also have this histogram on the right. And what you, you can see very quickly is that you have this large distribution where 30% of the work is being done in four days or less. Probably typically what you would expect if your stories are set up the right way and of the right size. Um, and on down the line, that 98%, that magical 98% point that a lot of people use for, to declare nearly done or set an SLA or something like that around, it's not a normal mean. You can see that it's really closer to 40 days, which is not what you would expect if you were looking at that first standard, normal standard deviation curve that I showed you. It's much longer than that, and it's because of these outliers that I talked about. Now, this chart of rally, you can actually look at each one of those dots and start to look at it in depth, understand what's behind it, uh, what tasks uh, are underneath it that might be blocking, whatever the case may be. And you can have a good discussion around those outliers. It's not to say these are bad again. We're not using this as a hammer to say these three dots are out of, out of uh, cycle or they're taking a long time. You know, let's, let's go um, beat somebody up about that. No, it's, it's to have that, that good discussion. And outliers are the key in software. They're very key. There's where, that's where you learn. It's where you learn how a team is functioning, what's getting in the way. It's where you learn about good research that that team is doing that you want to amplify. Whatever, again, those insights might be. The discussions usually happen around the outliers. The rest of the work is getting done as you projected or as you planned. So a lot of people also fear you know, all this work involved with collecting the data and, and the visualizations that you would need. And I would say that 90% you know, of what you need is already in the system that you're using. A system that gives you access to your data and allows you to report on it, visualize it, either out of the box or through a custom set of reports that you would create. Not a lot of work. You, know, you don't want to go off and start to create some crazy amount of uh, obscure metrics when most of it's in the tool that you're using. It's based on the process that you're using and what you've set up in the system. So the perceived cost can be a lot higher and therefore become a kind of a fear point for teams and that they don't really want to just make that investment. Plenty of data in the tools. The other thing you can do is, again, simple insights can be gleaned, or good insights can be gleaned from simple statistics. And what, we have this uh, concept of um, customer and employee satisfaction. Do a net promoter score, one or two questions, and I think you get a pretty good idea of, of how something is going that you want to take a look at. So the collection does not have to be hard at all. Since six and seven are uh, interrelated, the first one is too many. I think the picture says it all. I don't really have a lot to add to this other than that if you give somebody five dashboards to look at and 10 reports and they have to evaluate that at their stand-ups every day or every week through some sort of review process, they're going to shut off. They're not going to look at it. Plus, those, those metrics will start to conflict with each other. So keep your regimen simple. Identify you know, three or four in the key areas that you're looking, you want to look at, and then have a cadence around making sure you're evaluating those as you go. You also want to have enough to be meaningful. And I mentioned the software performance index work that, that Larry's undertaking. Uh, the whole goal here is, is, is um, twofold. One is balance, and one is to then figure out the metrics in, in each box that, that makes sense. So when you start to look at a software team's um, performance, there are elements of productivity around getting things done you know, quickly or being really responsive to change. Let's say defects come in, how quickly are you iterating on those? Uh, doing it right, you want to look at quality, but you also want to weave in and bring in customer feedback as well into that process. Make sure your customers are satisfied. Uh, doing it on time, is it, how predictable is it? Again, with the outliers being in, in, in the mix as well that you want to evaluate. So predictable within that context. And how's the team doing, really? How, are they happy? Are they um, satisfied with the structure of the team and how things are progressing in the work that they're doing? So it's, it's really important to keep everything balanced. If you overweight, um, overemphasize one particular box, you're going to end up doing well in that box, but poorly in the others. You can almost, I think you've probably seen these like spider charts where you, you can measure in these four dimensions and plot where you're at on each one, and, and you're going to want to have a nice distribution across them. 
So those are really the outcomes that you're striving for. You want to get it done as fast as you can, but in balance with the rest of these other areas, not just getting it done fast, because then that affects, let's say, uh, quality. Um, so find your set of metrics and keep them in balance. So those are things to watch out for, lots of specific details. Uh, we have um, this performance index research going on that I mentioned to you. We are working with a number of our customers very directly with access to their data to help define, based on those outcomes, where we would want to have or where we could see specific metrics that come out that, that really, um, that they can then use, but that we can also start to look at trends too. Because our ultimate goal would be to through this research is to deliver a set of standard reports and metrics that, that could, uh, and papers and such around that, that could really give you a nice starting point around an agile metrics regimen. So it's not all fire and brimstone here at all. It's, uh, there are definitely things you can do to measure, and you want to measure. Again, teams want to, empower teams want to improve. They're the ones making the decisions, ideally. They need to get better, they want to get better. So you need to help them do that. So again, start with the outcomes. Don't come up with a random metric and say this is what you need to hit. What you want to do is understand why that metric's important, relating it to an outcome that you have, and then uh, making sure that uh, as you see that metric that you're having good discussion around it. Make sure they're balanced. You do not, you do not want to overemphasize. I think it was mentioned this morning, the uh, software engineering toolkit. You do not want to burn people out. You do not want to overemphasize time to market at the expense of quality. Take a look at the whole package. Make sure things are balanced. Be careful in your analysis, right? Don't fall into standard traps of looking at process type metrics that maybe work in a different field. Uh, this tip chart is an example that we showed you today that, that gives you an idea of rather than coming up with a control chart, because we're not really trying to control things, we're just trying to gain insight so we can make better decisions. You use find the charts and the metrics that, that help you really make those good decisions. And then consider the collection costs in the end. Don't, uh, don't overdo it. Get maximum value out of the things the system already provides, and then add to that uh, subtly as you go. Uh, don't overdo it. Or it's going to become, number one, it's going to become overload. Number two, it's going to be something people won't do because it just takes too much time. And amazingly enough, that's all I have. That was really a lightning talk. So any questions at all? I think I have time for a few. How do you pull it out? I can walk through that a little bit more. Let me back it up here. So the tip chart here, there's really um, two sides to it. Let me walk over here. The dots that you see on the, on the left, the scatter plot, those are individual work items that you're basically um, categorizing or um, re um, reporting on. So each one represents a work item. On this chart within the system, you're, you can actually go in and open up that. You can click on it, open up, and start to see details, what tasks are underneath it. Uh, you can look at the, just the revision history of that particular item. Um, this vertical column with the percent number going down the middle, that tells you over time or over this particular time slice that you're looking at what percentage of these are done in, in that amount of time. So you, you have a number of days on the left. So what this basically is telling me is that the 50 per, uh, well, you get the 50% pretty quickly in four days. If you look at the 50% number near the bottom, 50% of your work items within this sample set are done in that four-day period. You go up, you can see that 98% point way at, at the top, you can see that's right around 40 days. So you need to look at those two vertical axes together, days and then percent done, percent of work items that you're looking at done. And then the histogram is just another way of looking at how many days and how you had um, a grouping of the number of days it takes for the aggregate number of work items. So in this case, 180 of your work items are done in zero to two days. Two to four days for another 120 of them. You start to see this normal distribution that I talked about occur until you start to go a little higher and you see the tail.
start to extend out, which is the phenomenon we see in software. A couple other points. This is actually a really interesting chart that I'll point out. You can see to the left, you do not have a lot of these outliers. The first. And there's other insights as you get practice with this that you can look at. I just mentioned the one where we didn't have outliers, outliers because we swarmed. You can see a holiday break in there in December and a hackathon break. We run internal hackathons, things like that. Yes, sir. Yeah, that good question. The question is, how do you analyze in the context of story size? You know, we, it's kind of, some of that's built in, but a lot of that also is, is around estimating and make sure you have a consistent way that you're estimating your stories. And so this, this normalizes around a certain size of story or, or story point estimate. And then by doing that, then you're also then allowed to, to take a look at your estimates as one insight that you might glean from some of the outliers, for example. But that is normalized across these. Any further questions? Yes. Yeah, there is. You know, I can talk to Naresh and follow up. We have some white papers, some research papers already coming out around the performance index framework that I've talked about, but some of the work. We have a great white paper on this tip chart that I think would be particularly uh, helpful if you're interested in it. So I don't have a copy of that with me, but I, I can talk to you offline afterwards, too, and just point you to it on our website. And then beyond that, I can make sure we get that information out through the conference. OK. OK, any other questions? I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, what would you measure against time? Time is one axis. Right. What do you measure against? What is the other axis? Well, the uh, bottom is, is time. There's a time element on the left. This is just durate. This is just a sequence of time. The two y-axis on the left, one would be number of days, and the other would be percent done. Number of work items done uh, as a as a increasing percentage, and that's also against that time. So, see the number ten on the left. That's ten days. Time and state for ten days. And if you come to the right, you see the 81% of our work items were done within 10 days. So you start to see that increasing. It's another way of looking at that bell curve, uh, but it's, it's actually on the, on the left, not on the right. And, and it gives you a, a chance to also factor in and see some of those outliers that I talked about. Does that make sense? And then on the right, it's, this is a companion chart. It's like two charts in one. The histogram on the right will basically tell you the number of total number of stories that were done in a certain number of days. So the bottom line here is zero to two days. This will give me the number of my stories in this case that were done within that range of time, so two days. Uh, if you go maybe towards the middle, you can see that between 24 and 26 days, there's probably one or two stories uh, that got done and that took that long to complete. But you can see, again, the outlier point that it, can, it extends on. There's definitely one or two that continue on all the way up to 46 to 63 days. 63 would be the high end in this particular case. We just create one last category with the, with the highest number of, of days. So again, the goal is to give you some great data that you can look at and focus on maybe those items that aren't performing the way you thought that they would. Okay. We're almost out of time. Anybody else have a question? Okay, thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your conference.